Hi, I'm Eva Kinsing, editor of IdentityWeek.net. Um, today I have an amazing uh, interview lined up with Niall McCann uh, from the United Nations Development Programme, which helps countries eliminate poverty um, and achieve sustainable and economic goals and enhance human development. Um, today we'll be particularly interested in uh, the availability of legal identity. Uh, it's a big topic at Identity Week Europe, which is coming up in June. Um, my first question then is, in what way is the UNDP concerned with identity? Well, I think, Evie, I mean, you know, we are all aware of the World Bank data sets now that have been published for a number of years, but the ones in recent years that focused on the number of people in the world who simply cannot prove who they are and the um, downstream then consequences for living their daily lives that that uh, imposes upon them, the well-documented ones of not being able to um, start businesses, even in some cases, register a mobile phone, open a bank account, inherit any property, uh, political rights like the inability to vote, and um, generally being considered invisible or being legally invisible in the country. That tends to um, result in people being being sort of isolated in a life of, of poverty and unable to extract themselves. Um, so that is very much are, are helping to close that global identity gap, which now I understand the bank is saying is 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 down to about 850 million people. But if you consider that still well over 10% uh, uh, of the global population, which is quite staggering. Uh, the figure is dropping, but it's still an enormous uh, amount, of course. And so UNDP considers it very much part of its mandate um, to help governments in particular to try to, to close this gap. And that's why we are involved in it now. We're not involved in it by ourselves. There's very much a coordinated United Nations vision on the issue of legal identity these days. And since 2018, we have a, a UN legal identity agenda task force that was set up under the auspices of or under the mandate of the, the Deputy Secretary General, who then put UNDP, UNICEF and the Department of Economic and Social Affairs as kind of co-chairs of this broader UN effort that also includes the Refugee Agency, UNHCR, the World Food Programme, the Population Fund, but also the High Commissioner for Human Rights, International Organization of Migration uh, and others to try to come up with a common UN vision for legal identity, because this is, as we are aware, it's an incredibly complex uh, uh, issue with all the proliferation of various digital ID programs uh, the continued underinvestment globally in civil registration matters. Can we kind of merge somehow the two systems together? Is that even appropriate? So there's been a need to have a kind of united UN vision on the policy side, but also in terms of working together at country level to be able to assist governments that request our help to try and help close this identity gap. So that's why we are involved in it. And like I said, more um, seriously since around about the 2018 period. And you mentioned there it's a combined effort with your global um, partners. Um, how do we realistically close the equality gap then and ensure everyone has a, a form of identity? I mean, look, that's an incredibly complex issue. I mean, uh, you know, we do, I think collectively across the United Nations, we would agree that a birth certificate and birth registration is, shall we call it, the gold standard of legal identity, right? And that the priorities should always be to try and register people at, clo at the closest point of their birth as possible. And if you have universal birth registration, well, at least that's a, a really, really good start for a person moving on into their, their childhood, teenage years, uh, adult life. And if for whatever reason that person ends up not in possession of a birth certificate later on in life, or that birth certificate has been lost or stolen, or indeed that there's no government record um, uh, of the, the birth registration and the certificate that was issued, well, at least knowing that the event took place and it was at one point uh, a certified does allow um, that person to possibly be able to rejoin an identity ecosystem or rejoin an identity scheme later on uh, in life. We, we tend to be a little bit skeptical of the view that somehow if we have hundreds of millions of unregistered adults, let's prioritize them. Let's get them registered first and then sort of work our way backwards to try and 
uh, register the undocumented children. And we are a little bit skeptical of that view because we do think there should be a holistic birth to death approach on this issue um, in, in UN member states. And we're always, of course, conscious of the, the, the two great political challenges then. If you end up with an undocumented adult, the adult has no way to identify themselves. And you want to somehow register that adult in whether it's a sort of a national ID card program or a new form of digital ID uh, program. Well, then the question, the age old question remains with what, ent with what identity does that person enter the scheme? If fine, if it's, if it's in many countries that do not suffer real, real political challenges around population, around demographics, around ethnicity or whatever, it may be possible for that to be a non-controversial um, registration. But if it is a country, where numbers of particular groups counts enormously in terms of the political power distributed in that country, well, then it is going to be very, very challenging. And um, building the overall national public confidence in the system, if there are lots and lots of undocumented teenagers or adults suddenly being registered in an adult-based scheme with an identity that cannot be verified back to their back to their birth. And of course, at the other end of the life cycle, if you do not have, for example, or if you're not prioritizing death registration as much as birth registration, well, then there is, of course, the possibility that or the identities of dead people are going to be appearing or continually uh, being present in various databases and registers. And of course, there's going to be large uh, uh, challenges around public confidence um, or the lack thereof that these identities of dead people are not suddenly going to be appearing uh, in terms of being able to uh, claim ghost pensions, various ghost benefits, etc., or in general that the, the the issue of dead people voting or dead people's identity somehow being being manipulated, that this isn't going to be a challenge, you know. So so we are a little bit skeptical about the about the single point in time adult based adult based registration is the priority, and we do tend to try to advise countries let's design systems from birth to death, let's include. Let's prioritize birth registration, death registration, and of course, the adult-based population register, national ID, digital ID schemes in between so that a person can be ideally traced and every human being does need to be traced and, and digitally, if, if preferably, from birth to death. Yeah, I totally agree with um, having a holistic approach, um, which is obviously a huge challenge. Um, to what extent are governments adopting national ID programs and overseeing uh, you know, the issuance of national identification numbers and bearer documents? Well, look, I mean, we, uh, you know, if you go back a couple of years, I think it was the, the, the figure showed that there was over 140 out of 193 UN member states that had some form of national identity register, which may or may not include the issuance of an actual national ID card. Uh, uh, so that type of scheme was in uh, operation in, I mean, 140 out of 193 is well, well, well over, over half, right? However, it, it's quite difficult to, you have to define what you mean then by a national identity register, a national ID card. I'm sitting in Ireland. We don't have a national identity register. We don't have a national ID card. In fact, the only really um, legitimate, comprehensive register of the population would relate to our our, our PPS number is our personal, our public personal public services number, um, which is required to to access any uh, public services uh, in the country. But it isn't a national ID register or a national ID card uh, system in the way it is in, in in other countries. Now, in answer or a more direct answer to your question, I mean, look, we completely understand if a government of a member state is looking at a scenario where they have large numbers of their population and indeed potentially foreign populations in their country that are not registered, that do not appear in any form of a population register. We, we completely understand that the temptation for that government might be, well, look, adults are the priority because if we can get the undocumented adults registered, well, then at least that will allow that person potentially to be economically empowered, as we said before, open a bank account, register a SIM phone, start a business potentially. So we see the temptation there. We're not trying, we would never tell a member state not to do that. And indeed we have been uh, supporting a number of member states such as Malawi, such as Honduras, 
uh, such as Tajikistan the last number of years to try and roll out and expand these, these adult-based systems. But we are always aware to advise them also that you have to be uh, a cognizant of the fact that you still have likely large numbers of unregistered uh, uh, children and children being born every single day that if there isn't enough resources uh, going towards um, manning the, the, the birth registration system, babies are going to continue to grow um, towards children while being unregistered. And that this is not a good uh, development. It, it dramatically uh, decreases the opportunities for that child uh, as they, as they uh, move forward in life. And that you have to think about equalizing the investments across the life cycle, um, as well as, as focusing on, on the adult-based systems. You've got a project, the UN Legal Identity Project, which is making a real difference um, in these third countries that you mentioned, um, where it's focusing on displaced peoples as well, minorities, um, people with disabilities. Can you just explain, you know, your work um, in these countries? I mean, look, we, we the UN never goes into a country and, and says, well, this is what we think you should do with regards to population registration. Right, we do have a, a UN legal identity agenda strategy. Um, it is this holistic birth to death model. Countries come at us uh, uh, at various stages of their own population registration system. So in some cases, for example, a country like Sierra Leone, it was very much more of a capacity building of the civil registration authority uh, uh, that was required rather than sort of hardcore financial or technical support to go out and register uh, uh, people into a new system, you know. In other countries, there's very much a focus on the legal system, the legal framework. I, I do think this is a topic, and perhaps we can discuss it more later, that there just isn't enough focus on when we talk about empowering people with new digital ID systems or whatever. And there, there is enormous challenges in a lot of countries to make sure that the laws that apply to civil registration of births, deaths, marriages, adoptions, etc., digital ID schemes, national ID, a card schemes and others so they are linked up so that eventually an individual is traceable throughout all of the systems and we don't don't end up in these bizarre situations where a child has an identity a in one system and then the adult has identity b in another system and in fact there is no way for the state to know it's the same person and that's a big challenge and, and so a lot of the legal work goes on Recorded because a lot of the times this can be one or two legal advisors that's into a country for a month or so just working on the law with them and it isn't this large scale large financial uh, uh, commitment in terms of buying computer equipment to go out and register the population etc. But then in countries like Honduras and Malawi it has been a much bigger effort and um, certainly on UNDP side to help the government design the new national ID system and then to assist in procurement of the equipment and to go out and register all of the population. Now, this has to be done, of course, completely aligned with the work that, for example, UNICEF is doing on birth registration. Like I mentioned before, if children do not have, and if there isn't enough government investment in birth registration, well then, is the investment in an adult-based national ID system going to, going to be um, sufficient enough um, uh, to challenge the fact that there's still going to be large numbers of undocumented people under the age of 16 or 18 uh, uh, in that country. We also have to be aware, of course, what our colleagues in the World Food Programme and what UNHCR are doing. Uh, uh, for example, UNHCR and, and WFP both have very, very advanced biometric registration systems that directly um, register their client populations in, in the countries where they, are, where they are serving. And there has to be linkages, there has to be close discussion between ourselves and UNHCR, for example, and the government about for example, the eventual transfer of, of refugees that may be registered in UNHCR system, that may be registered in that system for years, unfortunately, if they are in a host country for long term with no realistic prospects of going home anytime soon. Well, there has to be, we would argue, I think UNHCR would argue, that there should be some migration of those people into the host countries and um, identity registers so that the people are able to extract themselves somehow of the limitations of being a refugee um, in a host country and be able to empower themselves to be able to do things like open businesses or whatever as per the law of the host country where they're, where they're living in. We also have to focus with our colleagues in the population fund uh, about the importance, continually telling governments about the importance of demographic planning 
the importance of census conduction, the importance of being able to produce vital statistics that will allow a, a, any government to plan public services in the long term, where demographics are incredibly important, as we all know, with regards to building schools, hospitals, motorways, or whatever. Without accurate demographic population data, you just can't do that uh, in the long term. So these are examples, I think, of where the UN has to collectively work together alongside a, a governance, governments, and of course, there's a lot more. Really interesting there. There's loads of issues to unpick, which I'm sure you will do at the event in June. Um, my last question is, the boundaries are getting more blurred and blurred mm. between the idea of are you who you say you are or, you know, the government saying um, who you are. Um, what's your view on this and how can it be uh, tackled? <laughs> I think, uh, Evie, it's a, it's a wonderful question. I think we don't spend enough time speaking about this issue at a lot of identity conferences. We do tend to focus an awful lot on technology. We, we, we tend to focus on things like federated identity, decentralized identity, self-sovereign uh, identity. And we very much seem to focus a lot on the privacy rights of the individual, the individual's rights to assert the identity that best matches the, the individual's sense of themselves, right? Um, I can't help but notice that a lot of people that argue for a very self-centered identity model tend to come from political environments where there's just a general distrust of government, okay? And where there's a lot of maybe well-founded distrust of government. And I wonder sometimes, do some people Imagine an identity ecosystem or an identity sphere where I, Niall, are completely in control of my own identity data and I am able to assert to the government uh, changes that I would like to make um, in terms of my identity data, whether that be I'm going to change my name, I'm going to change my gender, I want to hide my age appearing in a lot of identity systems or whatever other identity variables um, that I consider either important to me that the government has not recorded or not important to me that the government has recorded. I can't help but ask questions like, well, hang on a minute. Governments need to have comprehensive population registration systems, not for their own purposes only, but on behalf of their citizens and their resident foreigners. I don't think it's a good thing if Niall is registered in a civil register in a national ID system, but then Niall decides to assert a different identity, a self-asserted one for the social security or taxation system, or for my passport or driving license or voter registration. There has to be some way to link a human together so that the state on behalf of its citizens knows that we are dealing with the same human being, even if the name or the gender is different, is different in different uh, a population. Um, uh, databases. And as we move forward in the coming decades, where we see or we can imagine perhaps a real takeoff of a metaverse or various metaverses where we're living more and more of our lives, where we are potentially generating much more of our own economic activity, uh, generating via non fungible tokens, via various cryptocurrencies and tokens usable in various metaverses, we have to, we have to accept the possibility that a lot of people may turn to the state and say, look, I'm not really interested in the identity that was recorded on behalf of the state when I was born or when I entered a national ID system when I was an adult. This is my identity today, the digital identity that I self-declare, that I live so much of my life um, uh, using. That's the identity that's important. And I want previous identities either unlinked to my real identity or actually to reflect who I am today, who I say I am. I really worry about the, the, some of the long-term societal um, glue uh, that, that, that breaking down traditional uh, uh, manners of registering people might, might have. And I, and I worry about that we're rushing a little bit too, too fast, I think, towards a world where everyone is just who they say themselves, who they say they are themselves. There is unfortunately a reality that you and I have rights to each other's identities. It sounds counterintuitive, but if we, if we accept, for example, nobody, nobody should be able to go to the state and say, I don't identify as 52 years old. I feel like I'm a lot younger, or I feel like I'm a lot, I'm a lot older. 
because of course that would have consequences. I feel older, I identify as older, and now I want my pension. Now I want my state pension earlier than what I am entitled to. Or I'm 16, but actually I identify as 18 and now I want to be able to vote. Now it's an extreme case, of course, but you have to accept then that there are boundaries and there are parameters um, that determine uh, who a person is and that the state has the right to assert that identity, regardless of whether the individual accepts that identity uh, or not. These matters are hurtling toward, uh, forwards very, very fast. I do think perhaps Identity Week and other uh, conference organizers should dedicate a little bit more time towards these issues and the general philosophy around identity matters now, um, as digital technologies uh, expand more and more um, in the coming years. That's a really interesting point that we, we don't cover at the moment. Um, I just want to reflect on your panels, uh, your panel sessions at the event. You're doing uh, a panel on ensuring security and foundational documents, which touches on some of these ideas and creating an accessible and frictionless digital ID wallet uh, relating to the digital ID and finance track. Um, it's been great to talk to with you today. Thank you for joining me. No worries. Thanks a lot, Evie.